Chinese state councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi is touring the South Pacific to promote security and economic cooperation in the region. Hello, I'm Mike Walter filling in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. Wang Yi visited the Solomon Islands on Thursday and also made a stop at the remote island nation of Kiribati on Friday. He will travel to several other South Pacific Island countries over the next couple of days, including Samoa, Fiji, Tonga, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, and Timor-Leste. The trip is a lead-up to the second China-Pacific Island country's foreign ministers meeting, which China will host in Fiji. We begin with this report for CGTN's Wang Kong. The main purpose of his visit is to enhance friendly exchanges, to deepen friendship and cooperation between China and Solomon Islands. They have signed a series of agreements and memos regarding cooperation in infrastructure, overseas students, airline development, athletic training, and etc. After all those high-level official meetings, Wang Yi and his counterpart jointly held a press conference on Thursday afternoon. My question to Wang Yi is about the controversy and even suspicion from some regional and Western countries on the security cooperation framework signed between China and the Solomon Islands. Wang Yi pointed out that on Solomon Islands' request, the security cooperation aims to upgrade the Solomon Islands police equipment and capacity to improve the social stability in Solomon Island. All the cooperation actions are in open manners. Wang Yi has also pointed three principles on how to deepen the security cooperation between China and the Solomon Islands in the future. First the principle is to mutually respect sovereignty. All cooperation are based on the needs and the requests of Solomon Islands and the negotiated on equal footing. The second principle is to assist the social stability of Solomon Islands. The cooperation is not directed at any third party. Uh, China and the Solomon Islands have no intention to build military base. The third principle of cooperation is that the security cooperation is in accordance with the original security arrangement. China is a firm supporter to the Pacific nations uh, to deepen their security cooperation to sustain its regional stability. Wang Tong, CGTN, Honiara, Solomon Islands. To discuss this and much more, let's bring in our guest joining us from Philadelphia is Nason Mabubi. He's a research scholar with the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. Joseph Gregory Mahoney is a professor of politics and international relations at East China Normal University, that's in Shanghai. Here in Washington, D.C., Chidanan Rajgata is a foreign editor and U.S. bureau chief with the Times of India. And from Beijing, Einar Tangen is a political and economic affairs commentator. We want to welcome all of you to the show. Einar, why don't I start with you? It's a 10-day trip in the South Pacific. What are the goals? What are the objectives here? Well, uh, quite frankly, uh, China's replaying its, uh, you know, what's been successful uh, with the ASEAN. Uh, in essence, they're trying to create another uh, trade area, but uh, any t attempt to block, uh, break out of uh, what seems to be, uh, you know, this kind of blockade that the United States is trying to set up, you know, sets off alarm bells. Uh, these are sovereign nations. Uh, China is appealing to them on the basis of trade, and uh, this is not seeing going over well with, um, uh, you know, the United States and also Australia. Nathan, let's talk about that. There are concerns in the West, Australia and the U.S. kind of wary of this trip. Uh, kind of outline what their concerns are. Uh, thanks, Mike. And first of all, I just want to say that I, I think the best actor in this, or the, the actor with the best position here are those Pacific Island nations. They have both China, the U.S., Australia, all uh, seeking uh, them to join uh, the different types of arrangements and packs that each of those uh, different uh, other larger actors are, are seeking to promote. So it's a great position to be in for those Pacific Island nations. You see Fiji having just joined, uh, or at least committed to join the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework from the U.S. side. 
Uh, you have obviously uh, Wang Yi's visit as well that you've just talked about. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, good options for those Pacific Island nations. Um, from the U.S. side, uh, it's clear that there's no political will within the U.S. for something like what used to be called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and now is the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, under the Biden administration is now trying to do something like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework that um, does not have the kinds of market access rules and uh, tariff reductions that are the centerpiece of the CPTPP, um, but have some, I think, largely aspirational language about digital economy, about clean energy, about supply chain resilience. Um, great for the Pacific Island nations to sign up for that and see what they can get out of that framework, even as they're also trying to get something out of the Chinese framework. Um, and both the Chinese and the U.S. and then Australia playing a role in there as well, I think largely are just sort of playing out this um, almost a kabuki theater amongst themselves, uh, trying to get these different countries to sign up for them. But again, I think the, the best position to be in is those Pacific Island nations to get all these options thrown towards them. Well, and talk about the irony of that, Nason, because these are countries that largely go ignored in many respects. Fantastic for them, right? So that's a great position. After being ignored for such a long time, they're getting so much attention, including uh, from Australia, which for a long time has maybe taken uh, countries like the Solomon Islands for granted and now are, are showing that they, uh, they take them very seriously because of the concerns about China moving into the region. Um, so again, I think the best position that's being held in all of this is by those Pacific Island nations. Joseph, let's talk about this. The first stop, uh, Solomon Islands. Reuters is reporting that uh, China is seeking a region-wide deal with the Pacific Island countries that would cover policing, security, data communications, cooperation. We could, of course, learn more about this on Monday with the foreign ministers meeting. Do you think that's true, and, and how is that likely to impact the, the region itself? Well, you know, I think the first thing we have to remember is that China has been uh, showing uh, attention uh, to this region uh, for two decades at least. And what we're seeing now is, you know, the, the fruits of those efforts. So, uh, I, you know, I, I agree that, uh, that these countries are in a, um, uh, a buyer's market, so to speak, as, as Nathan was saying. But the, the bottom line is, uh, I think China has competitive uh, edges. Uh, um, they've been going in and building solid relations. They don't have the difficult uh, colonial or, or, or neo-colonial history um, that, uh, that these countries feel, uh, particularly the Solomon Islands feel vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Australia uh, or uh, U.S. holdings in, in the South Pacific. So I think that uh, although it is a virus market, I think China uh, has some uh, competitive advantages, uh, above all because of China's uh, foreign policy principles of uh, not intervening in, in domestic affairs, uh, not uh, showing favoritism towards a particular uh, political party uh, and, and playing those kind of favorites. Uh, but I think that one of the things that we have to look at is um, where this is going over the next uh, several months. You know, we, we saw the IPEF, uh, uh, we saw this as a, as a big splash uh, this past week. And we also saw the, the prime minister of, of New Zealand uh, calling on the U.S. to return to, return to the TPP. Um, but this, this is really uh, showing that she doesn't have a clear understanding of U.S. politics. I mean, the reason why uh, we have the IPEF and the reason why we don't have the TPP is because the U.S. cannot get any treaty through Congress right now. It's not just uh, that Trump blew it up. It was doomed in U.S. Congress anyway. And so what we're looking at is this, you know, incapacity of the U.S., to really make a firm commitment to only offer some sort of plan or program. Uh, you know, so far, 12 countries with, with only $50 billion uh, dollars in, in terms of the IPEF. So I think that, uh, you know, if we look at uh, long term, if we look at uh, uh, the, the, the warnings of recession, of, of the silent surge of COVID, all these things that uh, are, are tipping right now, uh, I think over the next eight to 10 months, we're going to see the U.S. position really declining. Yeah, we're going to have to keep our eye on it. And of course, uh, shit and on, we're talking about the U.S. and domestic issues here, but Australia also uh, seeing itself suddenly uh, thrust into a unnatural un, uh, position for itself. Uh, the newly minted uh, Australian foreign minister uh, to Australia, Penny Wong, uh, basically admitting, hey, we've been ignoring our neighbor. Let's listen to what she had to say in Fiji. And Australia will be a partner that doesn't come with strings attached, nor imposing unsustainable financial burdens. 
We're a partner that won't erode Pacific priorities or Pacific institutions. We believe in transparency. We believe in true partnerships. We will respect Pacific priorities and your institutions. We will support growth and development that is sustainable. Chitta Nan, uh, she's talking about all the great things about Australia, but I think the people in the Solomon Islands probably remember that uh, one of the ministers in the Abbott uh, government was making fun of the fact that they were seeing sea level rise. Uh, the Morrison government also pretty much ignoring uh, their neighbor. That even became an issue in this most recent campaign. Talk to us about uh, basically how Australia is kind of on the back foot here. Well, not just Australia. I think <clears throat> the the entire quad grouping, the Australians, the you know Americans, Indians, were all caught napping. I mean, uh, China has been slowly expanding its footprint, uh, building uh, ties with a lot of uh, Pacific Island nations, and uh, you know there was really no attention, no focus at all uh, uh, from uh, the United States, from Australia, from India. For the longest time, the United States had forgotten about the Pacific. It was an Atlantis power. The Indians were focused on the Indian Ocean. Um, and nobody, I mean, you ask the Americans, you ask 99% of Americans wouldn't know where Solomon Island or where Fiji is. <laughs> you know, they would be completely clueless. So, yeah, this is a this is a new awakening. They have realized, uh, the United States suddenly realized that it's not just an Atlantic uh, uh, power, but also a Pacific power. It has you know, uh, uh, the two uh, big oceans on either side of the seaboard. And the Indians decided that uh, they their interests lay beyond Indian Ocean. Uh, the Indians also had, um, for, for the longest time, ignored their historical ties with Southeast Asia, with uh, uh, with East Asia. So it's all a, a later day waking up. And I think it was only a, a few weeks ago that the United States rushed a top-level diplomat uh, to uh, Solomon Islands to, after they realized that the Chinese had a head start and were actually on their way to building. I mean, the 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 the, the ties they're trying to build with uh, you know the police and civil society is the start of a military tie. Uh, that's where they get their toehold in. Uh, and so everybody's woken up. The Quad Group has woken up, and uh, they want to uh, you know uh, reassert their presence uh, uh, in 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 the Pacific, which uh, they had forgotten about. Einer, uh, what about his uh, comment that this is a start of a military tie? That seems to be one of the, the things that we're hearing from the West. They're very concerned about the fact that there could be a military base there, that China could have staged soldiers there or whatever. What do you make of that? Wang Yi saying that's not the case, but, but what do you make of these concerns? Well, a little hypocritical, given that there are 400 uh, U.S. State, uh, bases uh, surrounding uh, China, and, you know, Blinken saying that he wants the Biden-Blinken blockade, in essence. Um, I, I, I really, it's, it's just hard to fathom how people can get up and make these statements. Uh, China has not been, has not started any wars. It's not involved in any active conflicts. Uh, this idea that suddenly, um, you know, having a, a relationship with the police and uh, upgrading their, um, their training and their ability to respond to situations, which is important. Solomon Islands has had a uh, history of unrest. Uh, is somehow uh, akin to uh, providing nuclear submarines to Australia. I think it's a, bit, a little far-fetched. Joseph, let me ask you about this. Uh, I, I went back and looked up this quote because I remember from 2011, uh, the late founding father of uh, Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, said, uh, and this is a quote from him back uh, during the Obama years, Americans seem to think that Asia is like a movie and that you can freeze developments out here whenever the United States becomes intensely involved elsewhere in the world. Um, that... That seems to be uh, an accurate appraisal, not just of the United States, but Australia as well. Um, is this a case where both of them kind of took their eye off the ball, and, and as a result, there was a vacuum there, and China moved in to fill it? You know, I, I, I think that uh, absolutely they, they have neglected that part of the world. But, you know, the U.S. has not taken its eye off of Asia. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, what they're trying to do in, in South Korea, um, uh, what they're trying to do vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Japan, um, uh, clearly with AUKUS, um, uh, trying to reposition, expand NATO and reposition it uh, 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 towards uh, Asia or build a new military bloc in Asia uh, that complements NATO. Um, I think that, that um, what we're seeing is that there isn't a genuine concern uh, for uh, countries like the Solomon Islands because they don't represent a real strategic threat to uh, the U.S. or even Australian interests. So I think this is uh, much ado about nothing. I think for, for the U.S., 
uh, this, uh, where, where they're focused is, um, is in countries where they think that they can bring more leverage uh, against China and their broader containment strategy. Nason, of course, this trip is coming during a rather busy week. Uh, U.S. Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken out with a speech last night, which seemed to have a, a milder tone towards China. Uh, I want to play a little bit of the speech and also some reaction from Beijing, and I want to get your reaction on the other side. Let's listen. We don't seek to block China from its role as a major power, nor to stop China, or any other country for that matter, from growing their economy or advancing the interests of their people. But we will defend and strengthen the international law, agreements, principles, and institutions that maintain peace and security, protect the rights of individuals and sovereign nations, and make it possible for all countries, including the United States and China, to coexist and cooperate. Blinken's speech is verbose and full of schemes. In essence, it spreads false information, exaggerates the China threat, interferes in China's internal affairs, and it smears China's domestic and foreign policies. The purpose is to contain and suppress China's development and maintain U.S. hegemony and power. China is strongly dissatisfied and firmly opposes the speech. I want to get your reaction to both statements. So I, I did uh, listen very carefully to the speech, and I, I talked to some colleagues uh, in a virtual forum about it yesterday, so I've been thinking a lot about it. Um, I do agree with, uh, I think, your initial uh, statement that um, the speech did uh, have a milder tone uh, than we have uh, been accustomed to um, from U.S. administration, uh, uh, this administration, and, and, and certainly the Trump administration. Uh, if you compare the tone of this speech to this, uh, then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's speech at the Nixon Library a few years ago, uh, it's really it's really quite a large uh, difference. Um, there is some criticism of China in the speech, and I think uh, it's hard to imagine any speech by a political leader like the U.S. Secretary of State right now not containing criticism. Um, but I think that the language was relatively measured, and uh, there was a lot of sophistication to it. There was a lot of thoughtfulness to it. I'm not surprised that the Chinese side would uh, take issue with it. I think that's sort of built into the dynamic right now. Um, but I do think that it was noticed, uh, certainly maybe not um, expressed in official circles in China the way that was just expressed, but has was noticed in China that the overall tone uh, was milder. Um, and there were some things that a lot of, uh, I think, um, European partners and allies, uh, partners and allies in the Indo Pacific, um, uh, people within the US, uh, Chinese American community have been urging the uh, administration to take into account as they craft their China policy, and all that was reflected in the speech as well. Um, I don't think we've seen a more thoughtful uh, speech from a US political leader on China in quite some time, even though there's a lot of aspects to it that um, not only would be criticized by the Chinese side, but also could be uh, picked apart um, by some of us in the U.S. who look at these things very carefully. And, and Einer, uh, rather highly regarded American economist Jeffrey Sachs also weighing in on this, he said, uh, you know, perhaps the U.S. is kind of uh, reconsidering its harsh rhetoric that we've seen so much during the Trump administration and kind of a carryover to the Biden administration. He actually feels like this could possibly be an important st statement to kind of build on. I know we spoke last night, you weren't so sure of that, but do you think this could maybe open the door to, to perhaps a little bit more diplomacy? Clearly, the U.S. and China have to work on issues like COVID and climate change uh, if, if the world's going to move forward. Um, what's your sense? Well, I, I still stick to it. I, I see it as uh, State Department doublespeak. Uh, this was a PR effort aimed at, uh, you know, saying, oh, we're trying everything we can, possibly can with China. The issue here comes down to uh, these are words, let's see some actions. At the same time that uh, he's out there uh, saying, look, we're taking a softer tone, uh, in Congress, they're putting together a bill which would, in essence, I mean, the digital yuan does not exist internationally, but they're putting together a bill saying that any company that deals in digital yuan will be basically cut off from uh, SWIFT and the banking system. So, you know, you, you have to back up your words with actions. If this had been accompanied by some, uh, a couple of gestures or even one, that uh, showed sincerity towards changing the dynamic, that would be one thing. But when you're, you know, you're, you're making soft noises in the corner, but, you know, bringing out your hammer and hitting somebody's toes, I, I just really don't think that is sincere. So, Joseph, that's the view in Beijing. I want to see, is that pretty much how it's being received in Shanghai as well? I mean, a reduction in tariffs would be, of course, a clear signal that uh, things are softening. But, I mean, what, what did you make of this speech? 
I, I agree that it's double speak because I think we have to look at it immediately in the context, as, as Beijing does, of the statements that Biden made uh, about uh, responding militarily uh, uh, to, to any sort of uh, provocation against Taiwan. Um, I think that we have to uh, look at it in the context of uh, proliferating, uh, in my opinion, nuclear weapons to Australia vis-a-vis -vis AUKUS. And I think we have to look at it um, in terms of uh, the broader geostrategic uh, perspective, which Beijing clearly has an eye on. You know, I think, I think the real problem here is that uh, it's, it's clear to, to China that if they're looking at this conservatively um, in, in terms of what's actually being done, that there are three key elements to the U.S. strategic approach, notwithstanding whatever Blinken says about not wanting a Cold War or trying to uh, limit China. And the first is, you know, try to uh, establish or reestablish these grand military and economic blocks in Europe and Asia and connect them if possible, um, uh, including exploiting the war in Ukraine uh, to draw, to, to reinvigorate uh, NATO. Um, there's, uh, in, in Blinken's speech, but, but even before this, we've seen very uh, uh, clear language that has sought to embarrass uh, the Chinese leadership, building on uh, the demonization of language that has been playing uh, not just uh, during the Trump years, but throughout the Biden years. And I think uh, what, what is most concerning is that there, there seems to be this play at brinkmanship to the point where there, that where there are genuine concerns that we could see a war, um, uh, one that, um, uh, that, that China might be baited into um, if they're not careful and cautious, uh, above all, because the U.S., realizes that it's in a declining position. It realizes that, that, that China is going to draw parity or draw, draw uh, even with the U.S. within 10 years or, or 15 years by, uh, by most uh, assessments. And so the sooner the better uh, for some uh, thinkers in, in Washington to go ahead and have this conflict and move forward. You know, you brought up AUKUS. Uh, obviously, China also concerned about the Quad. There was just the meeting recently, uh, South Korea talking about how it wants to join the Quad. Um, what's your take on that meeting and all of these developments that we're seeing, and, and what does it say about how all of these pieces fit into the geopolitics that we see in the region? Well, that's, that's what I think is, again, you know, it, one of the things that, that, that China does, given the way its political system works, the way everything is, is one team and, and looks at everything simultaneously, is they don't get, they don't get distracted by one speech that might be interpreted as softening the, the position. They're looking at all the elements simultaneously in a very integrated fashion. And I think what they see uh, when you look at uh, the new leader in South Korea, the, 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 the direction of possibly uh, upgrading a missile system there that China finds very destabilizing, um, the trend in Japan uh, to, to expand uh, defense spending and, and uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, enhance attack abilities, how these are being supported by the United States. I think, I think China rightfully sees uh, a, a, a growing uh, danger and uh, is trying to uh, uh, prepare for it. Uh, Chinanon, I want to get your thoughts on this as well. Uh, Nason seemed to see some, some, you know, some slivers of hope there in this speech. Uh, we're getting a distinct different point of view in China. How do you view it? I, I thought it was a very, uh, uh, you know, mild speech and uh, forward-looking speech. Uh, the sense I got was, uh, you know, Secretary Blinken, uh, Blinken was actually uh, extending uh, uh, an opening uh, to rebuild uh, uh, the relationship. In fact, uh, it took me back, actually, to, to the Clinton era, where for a brief moment there was, you know, a sign that the United States recognized China as a rising power those days uh, and wanted a sort of G2 kind of formation. Uh, because uh, the uh, the successor state to the Soviet Union, Russia, was in decline at that time in the late 90s. Um, and I thought there was a little, you know, ray of hope. Uh, and if, the, you know, the Chinese reciprocate, I think there is a lot of appetite in the U.S. to rebuild ties uh, with China. I mean, the last, uh, you know, four or five years uh, have been fairly traumatic on uh, the bilateral front. Uh, but look, these are two premier economies in the world, and, uh, and the post-COVID economy, if they are to you know, come out of this uh, trough, it will require both countries to um, ar arrive at uh, new arrangements. Uh, they can't forever be locked into an economic 
um, a rivalry, much less a military rivalry. So I think, you know, the U.S. is um, putting out uh, feelers that uh, they are willing to listen to China's concern. At the same time, I mean, the, 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 the war in Ukraine, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine also has, you know, uh, forced the U.S. to look at uh, this whole uh, arrangement. And they don't want uh, Russia and uh, China, you know, getting any closer than they already are. So uh, I think there was a little bit of, uh, you know, bait uh, thrown out there in this speech. Uh, and of course, they have to stick to uh, you know, family alliance, but uh, I thought it was a very hopeful speech. So a hopeful speech. Nason, uh, he sees it as a ray of hope. How do you build on that, though? I mean, it, it is one thing. Words uh, need to be batched, matched with deeds. What kind of steps can be taken, concrete steps? Because he did say he's open to diplomacy. What, what, what do you need to see in the next, you know, weeks, months ahead to actually see where maybe this, this can build on something? Well, I think the three areas that most clearly we could see some progress um, in the not-too-distant future. First, uh, there seems to be some discussion within the Biden administration about uh, reducing the tariffs. Um, I think that's a step that uh, would be welcomed by many in the U.S. business community um, and certainly would have a, a large uh, impact uh, in terms of the overall atmospherics of the relationship. Um, certainly, uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, former Secretary of Kerry, now the climate envoy, uh, has been uh, plugging away on uh, discussions with his Chinese counterparts on cooperation on climate change. Um, and there may even be some things that can emerge in the area of public health uh, that can be concrete and, and, and be seen as, as positive. There will always be other areas of friction. I'm not too worried about most of those areas of frictions. I think the one area that worries me, I think has worried other people on this panel and, and worries people generally, is that of Taiwan. Um, I think there are hawkish voices on uh, both the Chinese side and the U.S. side um, that um, could uh, push that dynamic in a direction that may be hard to uh, put guardrails around. Uh, and so I think the Taiwan issue in particular is, is one of concern. Um, but otherwise, I see a landscape with a lot of uh, possibilities um, of progress. Uh, and, uh, and, and lastly, I just want to say that if the COVID restrictions start to reduce and students can start going back and forth between the two countries, and that was something that was also in uh, Secretary Blinken's speech, a welcoming Chinese students back to American universities, right. that can also play a beneficial role um, in the overall atmospherics of the relationship. Well, we've got about 20 seconds left. Einer, I want to give you a chance to respond. Uh, do you see the same sort of landscape he's describing? No, I don't. And uh, let's connect the two issues. I mean, American indifference is literally killing uh, these uh, South um, Seas islands. Uh, climate change threatens to engulf them. That is why they're looking for alternatives. And that, that is also why you know, these, these are kind of Johnny-come-lately uh, things. There has to be uh, actions as well as words. Otherwise, there's going to be no change this uh, unfortunate oh, uh, relationship. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you, gentlemen. I uh, really appreciate it. We need to leave it there. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching another edition of The Heat.